What's up everybody? I'm Dr. Jordan Taylor, the Undergraduate Exercise Science Program Director and Associate Teaching Professor at the University of Kansas. I've brought Dr. Dimitri Shabarkaba back in the studio today, today to discuss some research he published investigating whether basketball shooting mechanics and accuracy are affected when resistance exercise training is performed immediately prior to shooting free throw, two-point, and three-point shots. Dr. Shabarkaba completed his PhD in exercise physiology at the University of Kansas in 2021, and he is now the associate director of the Jayhawk Athletic Performance Lab. Not only does he currently direct and conduct studies aimed at improving athletes' performance on the basketball court, but Dr. Shabarkova has experience playing the game at a high level. Previously, he was a former Division I basketball player at James Madison University. And at James Madison, Dr. Shabarkova was a proficient shooter from the field. He averaged 10 points per game, and his three-point field goal percentage was 40%, which is indicative of excellent shooting from beyond the arc. Dr. Shabarkova also has some professional basketball experience as well. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Shabarkova. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure being here again to talk sports science with you. All right, Dr. Shabarkova. So you've been a busy, busy man lately, uh, traveling all over the place. Can you tell us about where you've been, how many uh, flight miles that you've added, <laughs> and uh, who you've been working with? I was just talking to my sister a couple of days ago, and uh, I accumulated, I think in a month, month and a half period, 20,000 miles, uh, you know, like just flying. And I'm like, Wow, that is that is something, yeah. you know. Um, you know, I have been traveling uh, across the pond, you know, in Europe um, to spread the work that Jayhawk Athletic Performance is doing, directed by directed by Dr. Andy Fry. Um, our vision is to actually improve understanding of sports science uh, worldwide, and actually through research that we are doing, um, help athletes, help community, help coaches achieve that peak performance. So, um, you know, it is a win-win situation for, for both sides. We're, we, we're able to collect research and publish it to help people get better. And who you, who you been working with here? Uh, so you want to throw out some names, yeah. some teams? A lot of NBA coaches. It was a lot of meetings overseas uh, with um, assistant general managers of Nets, Chicago Bulls, um, you know, Utah Jazz, many, many, many people that are in that region of the world looking for peak athletes and peak performers. So um, also that includes coaches that are coaching in EuroLeague um, as, well, as well as other leagues in Europe. So, And it's not just basketball. Again, uh, we're collaborating with many academic institutions within that region of the world. Um, as well as coaches such as, you know, volleyball coaches, male, female athletes, both mm -hmm. included, uh, volleyball athletes, handball athletes, soccer. It's something that will be coming up soon. But uh, again, primarily basketball is kind of our main testing, uh, testing bed. He's all over the place. The Serbian yeah. sharpshooter <laughs> will be coming to a country and town near you. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I do. I feel like there's like eight of you. It's like, wait, I thought you were overseas. No, I'm back. Wait, so yeah, he's he's everywhere. You know, he's a busy, funny. busy man. And now what we've we kicked out at this point, like sixty four research papers. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, you're you're staying busy. What were you gonna say? No, it was funny because um, I posted on Instagram, you know, one picture from I think I was in Croatia, and uh, my buddy's coming to drink coffee with me in Belgrade, and he says, "Listen, my son thought that I'm lying." He says, "Like why?" Well, he saw on Instagram that you just posted a picture in Croatia, so you know we're <laughs> sitting in Belgrade right now. So right. it's like you're all over the place, <laughs> you know. It's like. <laughs> Oh, a lot of fun. Hey, it, it fuels you, right? That's true. That it is true. You know, you. I always say my job is my hobby, you know? So it's like, you know, people say, people ask me, you know, Chelsea, you know, Chelsea in our lab. She always asks me, well, what do you do, you know, in your free time? Is it a hobby? I was like, I work. She yeah. said, well, that's not hobby. I was like, it's, it, it is for me. <laughs> well, you know, and what is it, the, st the statistic I've seen, like 90% of people hate their job. You're in that 10% that actually yeah. loves it. So that, that makes Luckily. things yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. All right, so let's jump right in now um, and talk about your recently published paper that is titled The Acute Influence of Resistance Exercise on Basketball Shooting Mechanics and Accuracy. You see, we got your name highlighted there. This is just showing your first author, your sister, Damiana. Shabarkabo is also, uh, you know, co-author on this paper along, you know, there's, there's a lot of flavor here from the Jayhawk Athletic Performance Lab. We got Nico there and Drake and yeah. Andy Fry and then you know Tony Sacconi he was um, he was at KU he was yep, at KU yep, as well yep, yep. so yeah um, 
you know, can you provide some background information on the paper, summarize the introduction of it, and then also maybe talk about the grant that funded it. Yep. So this was, there was a grant, grant money from the National Strength and Conditioning yes, Association. NCAA, yep. You want to maybe talk about that before we get into the kind of the background of this paper in the intro? Well, first, um, I will say I appreciate the support from uh, National Strength and Conditioning Association um, that actually funded this project. And uh, where did the initial idea for this project uh, come from? It was like, you know, when I was playing, it was always argument in the locker room. Oh, man. Should we live before practice or should we do it after? But again, you have a time constraints. You know, right. if you're a strength coach and if you're a basketball coach, you got to figure out when players are going to lift, especially during the dense in-season competitive period, yeah. right? So that was the initial idea behind this. And then again, I believe in a saying, you know, that like, okay, you can, you can make an argument, but again, in order to support that argument, you actually have to have a data. So we actually wanted to conduct the study in JAPL in our lab to examine, can resistance exercise uh, influence shooting mechanics and accuracy? So that was that was kind of long story short uh, behind this project. Yeah. All right. Um, so <clears throat> with with the introduction of this paper, the background of it, you know, maybe talk about what physical performance characteristics are important for basketball players to possess. You know, I think that. Um, in order for basketball player to be successful, they have to have a strong foundation of strength, agility, power, right? Again, aerobic, anaerobic capacity. That is just to match the on-court performance demands, right? right? Because all those physical performance parameters contribute to, I'll say, execution, proper execution of these basketball-specific tasks, such as rebounding, shooting, again, uh, sprinting, you know, avoiding defender, right? Again, that's why we always talk about, okay, concentric strength, eccentric strength, right? You get a slow down, mm -hmm. you get a break, change direction. So those are, those are all factors, I think, that are foundational um, right. in order for a basketball player to be, to be successful. Kind of reminds me, we had Dr. Quincy Johnson on another episode, yeah, and we, we were talking about football, and Dr. Johnson is a member of the JAC Athletic Performance Lab as well, but you think about things as like a pyramid, and like you said, foundational or at the base, depending on what sport an athlete participates in, but there's a lot of crossover. I mean, for a yes. lot of sports, you need, like you said, strength and power, right? Displaying force yeah. quickly. You need speed. You need agility, anaerobic capacity, aerobic capacity. Um, and then, of course, you've got the sport-specific skills yep. in basketball, such as, I mean, obviously, you've got to be an efficient dribbler and passer and Those are shooting yeah. and rebounding and playing defense. And obviously, being a proficient shooter, as you know, is, is going to be the most important of those basketball specific skills as far as for dictating who wins the game well you know? on that note i think that just to piggyback on that uh on that comment we actually conducted a couple of studies um examining the game related statistic right on nba and nca division two i think it was division two competitive competitive level but for example let's let's um briefly mention this nba study that we have uh published couple of years ago we looked at a span of three years mm -hmm. i think it was 2016 to 2019 we purposely wanted to avoid the covid period so we looked at actually all these game related statistics conducted discriminant function analysis to actually see which perform game related statistics or performance parameters contribute yeah was it rebounding was it field goal percentage was it yeah you yeah. know what was it so the shooting percentage shooting efficiency if you combine free throw two point three point right overall shooting efficiency it's around i think it was 25 or 26 explain 25 to 26 percent of total uh variance right so i mean you actually have the, the outcome the winning the game it's like largely determined how you shoot that night the second factor is defensive rebounding right and then you also get i think it's interesting people say well offensive rebounding is small part well, if you get an offensive rebound, you get another chance to score, right? But again, defensive rebound prevents opposing team to have another chance to score. So right. I think that uh, um, it is interesting when you look at that stat and we talk to multiple coaches um, that are members of our advisory board, such as Coach Mike Dean, that's my former coach, and I'll say um, – that, that, that his guidance, you know, is always present through projects mm -hmm. that we do as a practitioner. And I think that's of critical importance because we have talked about it earlier, having people that are actually within the sport, you know, right. actually connecting science um, with sports. With sport, yeah. 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 And, and so, so basically at that span of three seasons you looked at in the NBA, the two factors that predict a winning outcome 
field goal percentage yep. and defensive rebounds. So you get a shoot good and you get a you get a you get a there good you go. rebound. There you yeah. go, coaches. Get you some good <laughs> rebounders and some proficient shooters from the field, and you're going to be more likely to bring home that championship trophy, right? You know, it's funny because I mean, to coaches, they, well, they, they, all well-established coaches right. know that, you know. But again, mm-hmm. uh, we had to show that um, as to explain our reasoning why we are examining shooting mechanics right. because I was like, well that is a large contributor. Yeah. So actually shooting three, four, five percent better, mm-hmm. you know, it is it is very important. I mean, you think about like people say like, okay, well, three, four shots. Wait, 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 wait. It was a three-point shot. That's a nine to 12-point margin. Mm-hmm. I mean, nine to 12-point margin, that's a, that, that's a big difference. Yeah. So just making three more shots. Right. You know, y- y- and like you said, coaches know this. And, and yeah. really – what you've done is just validate what they know. I mean, that's you're, true. You're, you're, that's you're, true. you're linking the data and the sports science to your and to, to what's already known. And, and, and uh, you know, like you said, the practitioners, you know, the coaches, the athletes, they players know this, but what you see in the lab, it just yep. ties right in. So true. like you said, building that bridge between the sports science, the research side and coaches, athletes that are, that are right there doing it. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so, so based on currently available scientific literature, seems like maximal strength seems to be the most prominent among the previously mentioned performance attributes. Now, I know some of your studies maybe didn't line up with that. Yeah. Well, well that what was... do you have to say about like the relationship between a player's upper body and lower body strength and yeah. basketball specific performance? You know, I think that that is a, that is that is interesting that you bring that up because. Um, First, let me let me let, let me open open this um, discussion about maximal strength, upper and lower body strength. With this, there are multiple studies that actually show that um, strength is positively correlated uh, with a playing time or on court basketball performance. I think there was a stun, study done by Dawes et al. Right. looking at the maximal upper and lower body strength. Again, one RM um, that players who attain greater values in um, back squat, barbell back squat, 1RM, and bench press 1RM were capable of securing more playing time. I mean, you know, that shows, wow, well, that's a good It seems intuitively yeah. to make sense. It's like, yeah. well, if you're stronger, your lower body and upper body, you're going to be more likely to play more. That seems intuitive. Yep. And then you have another study I think that I really um, like to use. It was by Hoffman in 1996. It was a uh, old but good. Um, they actually looked at a player's you know, I think it was a four four year season span. During the first year, there were was, these college players. Yes, college okay, players yeah. so across uh, their collegiate yes, career. Yes. So the first year, I think it was eighty nine ninety. It yeah, was, okay. it was a, a, a long time ago, but it's a it's a great study. We actually look at the first year, and there was no strong correlation between between maximal lower body strength or one RM in barbell back squat and uh, playing time. Mm-hmm. However, the second season and third, there was a I would say moderate to strong correlation, statistically significant moderate to strong correlation between lower body strength and playing time. But what happened the first year? And I think uh, uh, Hoffman et al. did a great uh, great job there talking about that uh, first year, there was no well-implemented administered strength and conditioning uh, wow. training. Okay. Right? So as soon as they start, as soon as they got under the barbell in a weight room, I mean, the things started changing. Again, they also mentioned that a uh, large, large percent uh, percentage of variation that's attributed to that playing time comes to coaches' evaluation. Again, that's why coaches are getting paid big bucks because they have a sense to know who is good, how can right. somebody fit in a starting lineup. But again, if we're looking at these physical performance parameters, I think that that is, um, that is one of the important parameters. Right. Now, you, you know, you think of how lower body strength can tie in with some of these physical performance characteristics that help predict a winning outcome. So it's like <laughs> yeah. you would think, well, you know, you have two players that are the same height, one on team A, one on yeah. team B, but the athlete on team A has a higher vertical jump because their lower extremity is stronger and they can produce that power and that force more quickly and get up off the ground to get that defensive rebound that helps predict is one of the predictors of a winning outcome. Well, there's mm-hmm. how that may underlie 
performance. And, I think and, uh, the, the great way to portray this or metaphorically represent this is by a puzzle. You know, this strength is just a piece of a puzzle. Yep. You know, lower body strength will not tell you the player is going to score five or 15 points right. that night. However, that is a foundational piece. And I think that these findings, uh, Warnicki et al. did study in 2022, I, I think the last year published it, everything that we said about importance of strength um, applies to younger uh, you know, amateur, I would yeah. say, I think they were a 15 or 16 year old basketball players. But um, right now, I will uh, I will come back to the question that you asked me that one of the studies kind of that we published from our lab doesn't line up with this. Well, what yeah. we wanted to see is actually, okay, we talked about shooting, how important shooting is. But let's see how 1RM for back squat and bench press correlate with a um, free throw two point and three point shooting efficiency. What we found um, is no presence of any kind of statistically significant correlation. Yeah. So when I present that data, people say, wait, you're saying that maximal upper and lower body strength has no correlation, no significant correlation with free throw two point and three point shooting performance. I was like, that's what this data shows. However, the most important piece of information that people kind of tend to overlook is that these players that we examine were resistance trained and did have basketball playing experience. So they likely possessed the level of upper and lower body strength that they need to perform, I will say, uh, free throw two point and three point shooting motion to best their ability. Right. It was already there. So yeah. would further gains in strength be beneficial? That's to be examined. But again, you know, we cannot say, well, that's not important because if you look at the values that we observed for maximal lower uh, and upper body strength, right, they match with the individuals, you know, collegiate players or, you know, like uh, uh, minor league professional players, which actually shows, right. okay, well, you know, this gr this cohort of participants that we examine already possessed what they need to execute these movements to the best of their um, ability. Right. So, you know, I think that making a conclusion based on that data without interpreting the numbers right. would yeah. be would be inadequate. And it's yeah. one of those things that's like, yeah, the maximal strength is important, but it's not the only factor. I mean, that's this true. is not the only factor that, that underlies your ability to play basketball or any of these other physical performance characteristics. But it's a piece of the puzzle, like you said. I, I think that's a great way of putting it. And um, you know, it kind of reminds me of uh, Nico Philip. I know he's he's in the Jack Athletic Performance Lab yep. too, and he's looking at maximal strength and 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 sprinting. And it's like, well, at what point yep. are you strong enough? Is it a squat of one point seven times your body weight or two times yep. your body weight? And then if any more strength gains, they don't really help you with sprinting faster. So at what point should you? Maybe focus a little less on trying to gain more max strength, but just focus more on sprinting, sprint technique. I talk to Dr. Fry about this all the time. You know, uh, if you if you can, for example, to get a rebound, you need, I don't know, let's say 0 0.3 seconds. Let's say if that's a time frame that you have to, okay, position yourself and get a rebound, defensive rebound. Mm -hmm. So if you can produce even greater strength within 0 0.6 seconds. Yeah. Okay, well, you can produce more force, you know, like, mm -hmm. but that's useless because, you know, you got to execute. And so it's so much of it is not even related to strength with rebounding. I mean, that strength yeah. helps, but it's not like it's the only thing. I mean, it's it's body position and understanding of, that is true. well, if a, if a player is shooting from the wing, you, you get a feel of where the ball is likely to come off the rim. Then, I mean, maybe looking at Dennis the arc Rodman. on the shock. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You just get this intuitive, you have this knack and this sense of where the ball is likely to come off of the rim. That's true. And you can position yourself to box out, to get in the proper position before you even have to jump that for the rebound. True. You're already in position. That so just true. positioning is so key with yep. rebounding. It's not like maximal strength is the only thing, although it will help. I mean, it can help you get into position. It can help you produce that force. But. I mean, boxing out, you know, I think that a half of a rebounding, you know, you, you can jump. But, I mean, where are you jumping? You know, you actually have to secure the position. That's why right. those coaches say box out. Who well, can secure the position fastest? Yeah. Exactly. And then you need the strength, you know. I mean, if you have a 250, you know, uh, pound guy, you know, like pushing you under the basket, <laughs> you better be strong in order to resist Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. And you can see as you move up in those levels, collegiate, professionally, I can see how, you know, the strength would maybe become more important because you are going to be with more physical, larger 
You know, uh, I think that, that is a, th that's actually interesting that you bring that up because I think it was three, four years ago we have published study. We have looked at a cohort of athletes, uh, elite NCAA Division One collegiate athletes over a seven-year span, right? It was seven seasons, right? And, and seasons. And we looked at, okay, let's see, you know, differences in strength and power. And what we actually found is the greater values of strength and power were associated with higher levels of competitive play. So we actually had players that completed four years of eligibility, didn't play pro. And players that completed four years of eligibility, but played professionally on a right. professional level of competition, again, other than NBA and again, third category NBA. And again, what we have seen that greater values were associated with a greater level of play. Again, showing that strength and power capabilities are those foundational pieces that basketball players need to possess. Yeah. So stronger, more powerful, more likely to play at a higher level, assuming you have all of those other That's true. Yeah. basketball yeah. sport-specific skills, right? The that, dribbling, the shooting, the, the puzzle, passing, the I, basketball the IQ. You know, knowing the game, understanding it, um, that all has to be there, I obviously. mean, people always talk about Nikola Jokic, you know, for example. They say, oh, well, you know, he's an outlier. He doesn't look like the rest of the players. I was like, well, don't let that fool you. Right. He's in the weight room. That's Just because he, you know, is not focused on hypertrophy and, I don't know, building the muscle. I mean, he's still, you know... Uh, uh, doing strength, power training, plyometrics, I mean, all, right. all, all that stuff. And again, on the top of those physical performance attributes that he's developing, he actually has a great knowledge of the game. I mean, right. he knows when, how, where to pass the ball, you yep. know, and help his team secure the winning game outcome. Yeah. yeah. That's great, great points. Yeah. Any other points you want to mention with the intro um, as far as, you know, kind of leading into into the purpose of the study? I think that we mentioned my, uh, uh, main things because I think that knowing that strength is important and that you can develop it by well-implemented and well-developed strength and conditioning training programs, right? Training regimens. Um, now the question is actually how that fits within the competitive season span. How actually can we work on maintaining um, strength levels. I had one of my coaches, he's, he's actually coaching in a, one of the biggest teams in Turkey right now. And we were doing like performance monitoring, right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, on a force plates. And he says, wow, my players are not getting better. Everything is kind of staying the same. And I was like, wait, you have a, you have eight wins in a row. Right. And we have, we did this testings on a bi-weekly basis and your performance is basically staying the same. I was like, you should put it on a billboard. That should be advertisement for you because you know, basketball, especially baseball, I mean, there are long seasons and it's kind a lot of, of games. hard to condition, you know, and maintain that peak performance that you attained during the preseason competitive period. But to me, it was like, I was joking around with him and I was like, you should really take that data and put it as a billboard for you because you as a strength coach were actually capable of maintaining Main. their performance throughout the season. I mean, we're not going to get exactly four, four time metrics that actually demonstrate right. it. But again, uh, to me, that was actually very interesting. But yeah. Yeah. And that can be tough to do. Like you said, it's it's not like, a, you know, basketball and, and baseball are not like football where yeah. you just have, you know, maybe 11, 17 games yeah. in a season. It's 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 like you said, it's a dense schedule. I mean, so, especially if you, if you take, and, yeah. I mean, NBA, how many games they play? I mean, Euro League, Euro Cup, mm -hmm. uh, Adriatically. I mean, they get an old travel. Multiple teams, for example, in Europe play in a two different leagues. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a two games uh, in a week. You got to travel. You get you got to fit. You know your training mm -hmm. that you have to do with players to maintain their performance levels. You got to fit it within. I don't know uh, everything that they do off the court. I mean, sure, basketball specific training sessions. But again, okay, is that a media? Is it a press conference? Is is that like a family time i mean it's, right. a, it's a thousand different things you actually have to consider and then still make sure yeah, performance it, it makes it tough change. for a strength yeah. coach i mean they <laughs> really got to be knowledgeable and smart with the way they design a program because yeah. you don't want to overtrain. you don't want to um under train like you said at least if you can maintain where they're at in the season you're that doing you're doing a great job yeah so maybe we we'll get into the purpose of the study so we can pull up uh picture three here all righty. So we're looking here. You want to just talk about what the purpose of this study is or was, should I say, since it's been, yeah. been published? So we actually wanted to see if um, some of the most commonly implemented resistance training programs, right, uh, for des designed for upper body or lower body 
can have impact on basketball shooting mechanics and accuracy. Again, acute impact, right? Right. So what are performing, will performing these training sessions prior to practice um, have impact on shooting mechanics and accuracy? And if there is an impact, how long that impact will be present? That's right. why we, when we talk about methods, that's why we utilize that methodology with multiple, I will say, um, shooting sessions, testing sessions within, um, I'll say, two hour, two and a half hour time yeah. frame. Yeah. And I know I used to wonder that back when I played in high school. I was like, man, should I, should I lift? Is it okay to be lifting before practice? Yeah. Is that going <laughs> to affect my shot? Am I going to look like absolute garbage out there? Or will it not? I mean, and then you think about, well, how much volume should I be doing in that weight really training true. session if I lift before practice? Because I don't want to be fatigued out there. Or that if I'm fatigued, that definitely could impact my shot. That's true. And so it's, it, yeah, it's one of those things that I think a lot of basketball players, I'm sure coaches, people wonder is, does it have a negative impact? If you lift before practice, or is it, is it going to affect the, the shot mechanics? You know, I will say this. Um, coaches will probably like what we're going to say right now, but basketball players are not going to be happy, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I think that is just a little bit, uh, you know, quick insight into um, conclusions of right. this study because uh, I think there was always, you know, players, were, well, saying these things such as oh is it gonna mess up my shot should i lift it should i do upper body should i do lower body right because i see you know in the purpose exactly. here i've got it broken down it's like so you looked at both would an upper body session only exactly. affect negatively or yep. no effect on yep. basketball shooting performance what yep. about lower body yep. is is one gonna have more of a negative impact than the other or maybe yep. not well we'll get into talking about yep. it so um Let's get into discussing the materials and methods used to conduct uh, this research study. So maybe describe the study participants first. So, um, you know, who were these study participants? Can you kind of describe, you know, who were you looking at? Were they, uh, had they, did they have any basketball playing experience? Yeah. Had they played at a high level, maybe high school experience? Yeah. What, talk about the participants. So I think that it's um, important to mention this, that we examined 10 male basketball players with previous basketball playing experience. Again, um, they either play collegiately and still playing recreational, or they play, I will say, in other leagues um, that, are, that, that you're able to demonstrate sufficient mm -hmm. basketball knowledge right the, the, these individuals were not novice players and also it's very important to mention here that they were resistance trained so they did actually had um, two or more more years of resistance training experience and they did participate in resistance training um, more than two times per week so they were not novice they were they did possess basketball playing experience previous basketball playing experience as well as they were resistance trained and that's so important because people that is very important got to realize you, yeah. you can't compare this study to say another study that might be similar to Dr. Shabarkaba's where maybe in another study they looked at resistance training and its effects on shooting performance but maybe the athletes um, didn't have as much basketball exactly. playing experience, or maybe they were untrained, right? Yeah. And they'd and never I, done resistance training I before. Talk, you I would get different the, results, yeah. possibly. I talk to Dr. Fry about this all the time. Uh, you know, it's like people make conclusions and say, well, this resistance training program does this. Well, this does this. I was like, well, who are the participants? Right, look at the participants I was like, first. You know, are, are those individuals trained, untrained? I mean, if you're untrained, whatever, whatever you do, you, you, you can do only a little bit, and of course you're going to induce some effect training right? effect yeah adaptation Ex adaptation right but again who are your participants you know if you have a, a lebron james performing um five twenty twos on the court i mean it's like oh whatever you know yeah. i'm well trained but if you've been have, doing this for years if you and i go right now i think that <laughs> right. yeah i mean exactly it's like you can't compare apples to oranges right exactly. it's like make sure if you're reading one study and and you look at those participants it, it, they, they, and you're going to compare it to maybe a whole nother group of studies are the participants similar, right? Before you jump to conclusions, yeah, yeah. right? So um, let's talk about the procedures now that, are, that were used to conduct the study. So we've got um, this picture four up here on the screen and uh, maybe run us through this. How was this study conducted? Um, give, give us the general overview. So the 10 participants that we examined in this study visited the lab on four different occasions, right? So visit one was dedicated to familiarization uh, of participants with the testing procedures. Um, again, that's when 1RM testing protocols for uh, 
lower and upper body were performed, as well as shooting qualification protocol. When I say shooting qualification protocol, again, it wasn't um, nothing crazy hard. Again, it was that participants had to show proficiency in executing free throw two-point and three-point shooting movements, such as more than 50% um, accuracy in uh, free throw and two-point shots. Again, mid-range 17-footers, and again, more than 30%. Again, uh, I'll say... For three-point. For, for, for three-point, three, right. Three um, so, Were they excluded if they didn't hit those exactly, benchmarks? Exactly. So, yeah. so you had them come in and visit one. If they couldn't make, if they could not make at least 50% of their free throws and, and 50% point, of yeah. the two-point yeah. field goals... They were excluded. Yeah. And, and also then at least 30% of their three-point yeah. shots. I will say all participants made that uh, uh, met the criterion. Uh, again, this wasn't anything very compl- complex, but again... You just have to have to, some baseline, exactly, right, to include. Yeah. That's your inclusion criteria. We wanted yeah. to make sure that uh, individuals did show uh, adequate levels of proficiency. And again, if you will see that in results after, but again, um, they all participants, I will say... Um, had a much better performance. It was like from free throw was 78, 79% uh, on average, you know, two point, it was 62 and three point about 50%. So that is, I mean, these individuals Which makes were sense because they, they played basketball. Exactly. Before, so, so you would kind of expect yeah. that. Yeah. So after this visit one that you can actually see here, um, we randomly selected individuals that will start with a control session, upper body or lower body session. So they're again, divided into three groups, as you yeah, see there on yep. the chart. And in each individual perform each condition. Again, control, lower body, and upper body. So for control, each individual, when they arrive to the gym, they perform a standardized warm-up protocol consisting of ace kips, uh, you know, butt kicks, high knees, Spider-Man crawls, you know, like a, like a regular Typical dynamic warm-up. warm-up protocol, right? Yep. Um, and after the completion of the warm-up protocol, they proceeded with performing five sets of free throw, two-point, and three-point shooting drills. Okay. So what you can see here is that's marked with B as the basketball shooting drills, right? Um, they were composed of 15 free throw shots, 15 two-point shots, and 15 three-point shots. Okay. An important thing to mention here is that um, the drill pattern... Um, was kind of star for two point and, and we'll three have, shots. We'll again. have a picture of yeah. that coming up. Yeah, yeah. but again, uh, it is very important to mention that this was purposely uh, non-fatiguing protocol. So right. um, there was no pressing that they have to run or do that within a certain right. amount of time. Because if we're looking at a fatigue, that that is going right. to induce totally different effect. And that's actually right. something we're looking right now. How fatigue right. influences these. Um, per, but you didn't want that variable to exactly. adversely affect this study because yeah. it could, yeah. Yeah. So, so. we wanted wanted it to be without a presence of fatigue as as much as it can be. So again, they did five sessions of shooting drills within thirty minute time break in between each of those. So at, for a control session, they came in, performed warm up session. Okay, good, done. Shot fifteen three, free throw, fifteen two point, and fifteen three point shots. Had an active rest of 30 minutes, repeated it again. So it was a 0, 30-minute, 60-minute, 90-minute, and 120-minute uh, mark that we have done. Okay. So it was actually very complex to conduct. And then three to seven days apart, they returned back to the lab for visit three, where they actually performed upper body training session that we can actually see after uh, we followed NSCA guidelines for developing these training protocols. And we were in a communication with multiple strength and conditioning coaches to help us just verify the design the upper yeah, exactly. body workout. And um, after performing the upper body training session, again, they pr- pr- uh, proceeded with uh, performing warm up. And then again, five sets of basketball shooting drills separated with 30 minute, 30 minute rest interval, right? So they re- re- repeated that basketball shooting exactly. uh, protocol. Exactly. And after visit, the yeah. upper body training session. Exactly. And, and it th- was immediately after, right? Uh, yes. So it was as soon as they were done, they immediately went on a court and performed the shooting. So as soon so, as they were done lifting, upper body lifting, and about how long did it take to do the upper body workout? I think it was probably around 45 minutes, you so know, they, something regular that they okay. would do. Yeah. That sounds, yeah, yeah that yeah. sounds reasonable. So a 45 minute upper body workout, bam, go right over and do your shooting. Yep. Shooting either. drills, your two-point, your free throw. Your you free throw. know how our lab is, I will say, oriented. So we actually have our lab is right here. So they immediately crossed the hole when they were right yeah. there on the court. So right. it was legit within the 30 seconds there. As soon as they left the dumbbell, Go they shoot. were right on the court. Yeah, yeah. everything okay. was ready for them. That's and the important. same thing applies for lower body training session. Instead of upper body, again, they came back three to seven days apart. Um, after three to seven days after completion of the previous um, 
I'll say visit to perform lower body training session, warm up, and immediately. So another on the lower body day, another about 45 minute lower body session, cross the hall, go do your shooting. Okay. And then, um, so that was the control group. Anything you want to say, I mean, with the other groups or? Uh, that was well. That was a, basically the shooting drills were the same for well, yeah. control, upper and lower body. That's yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Because you. So this was like a crossover design. Yes. So, so. The, the randomized crossover design where basically each participant again performed control, upper and yeah. lower body. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You want to move on to the uh, the next? Yeah, we can see. Uh, I mean, we can see actually the shooting grabs again. You can uh, you can see that the first fifteen shots that they attempted was performed from a free throw line. Again, standardized distance four fifty seven meters. Uh, I use meters, uh, SI unit. Right? right, meters. What's that? We're in America. No, so this is so this is the. Uh, so yeah, we're on uh, what picture five now? Yeah. So picture five, yeah. we've got. So yeah, this shows the. Uh, the free throw two point and three point shooting drills. Yeah, and again, there was a star pattern. Again, all two point shots were attempted from like a seventeen feet mid range jump shots, uh, where I mean, where you would tip commonly shoot from in a game. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you've got you got along the baseline there on the right and left side of the basket. Corner, you've got yeah. the wing. 45, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and again, the same star pattern repeated for three-point shot. Again, the distance was 675, 6 meters, 6.75 meters. Again, the new college uh, line that corresponds to European regulations. Oh, uh, my gosh. <laughs> 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 European guy is not disappearing right, right. for me, you know. I've been here for what almost thir- it's going to be 13 years soon in US, but the accent is still here right. and the, you know, <laughs> European roots are still present, you know. So yeah, you said that's uh, the, the three-point shot, the typical three-point college college line. Uh, right now, yeah, the new one. Right, yeah. the new one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think the change happened either 2021 or 2022. I was yeah, done man, playing, I mean, but yeah, uh, yeah. Players are just becoming so ago, efficient yeah. from shoot, so proficient I mean, at shooting threes. It's like you, you got to keep moving the line back. If you look at I mean, it, it's getting ridiculous in the NBA. Now some of this yeah. is like everyone thinks they're Steph Curry now, but this is trickling down to even the high school level where <laughs> You you watch these games, these high school games, and it's like you're not even running your offense. Like you, the point guards dribbling down court. As soon as they cross half court, they're firing up a three, and it's like. Well, this is this is what you have. In majority of plays, you have again. I'm not a coach, but when you actually see it again, that is a that is a beauty of coaching, and they have to figure out efficiency to score, right? But what I, what 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 uh, what I can see is you know, point guard dribbling down the court. It's usually one either pick and roll. If pick and roll is not available, then drive down the lane. If you can't see it, you find like somebody open in the corner. Yeah. I mean, you just spin it back again. Player drives down the baseline. If you can't find it, find somebody else and run it again. But again, to me, that's um, it, it is interesting. And if you look at these heat charts, for example, the mid mid range uh, jump shot kind of it's not common right now right, in basketball. It's not. Uh, and, and right now, you will have everything around the basket or you know be on the three point line. And right? you know, I think back to like basketball in yeah. the '80s, '90s. I know we're going on a tangent here, but I mean, I may think of Michael Jordan. He <laughs> yeah, had so many mid range jumpers. Yeah. You know. 15, 16 foot, you know, spinning around, hitting One that dribble, fadeaway. One dribble, pull up. Yep, yep, yeah, I yep. mean, so many mid-range shots. But, and a lot of times those mid-range jumpers are the harder ones to make. It's like when you mm-hmm. set up and shoot That's a three, you, you know, you're set up, you're focused, or when you're just driving the basket to do a layup, but it's those mid-range shots that are really tough, especially off the dribble. It, 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 and add defender that's right yeah. next to you in your face. So that is, it is tough to make. Yeah. So like, I, I do feel like that is a dying component of the game. Like you said, you look at those heat, those shot charts, and it's like it's three-pointers, and then it's all and these shots the around the, bu- you're around the bucket. You're catching lob and dunking. Yeah. 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 Well, all right, so that shows you know where all the, the, the shots were taken from in this study, the, the free throws, the two-point, and the three-point. Um. I guess we can go to uh, what picture six is next. Yeah, with the variables yeah, that we have, I think. So that's... we'll pull up picture six here. Oh, who's that guy? That's that looks like sharp... that looks like the Serbian sharpshooter right there, Doctor <laughs> Doctor Shabarkova. That is a sharpshooter. Yeah, right there. See, why are you always putting yourself the pictures of you in these studies you conduct? You know, people say, "Are you promoting yourself?" I was like, "No, that's the easiest person to obtain informed consent from. You know, for for authorization to put a picture. You know, if you hurt yourself shooting, you know, it doesn't matter. There's no way." that you have to have no, somebody else No, it's my own fault. Yeah, like you roll yeah. your ankle, you land funny. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, a, you know, <laughs> well, for journal, right, you actually have, because these are no, uh, some, in some journals actually don't allow you to blur the face or uh, right. put like a little uh, square around the face. Yeah. You know, I, I think that maybe JSCR is like that. I think that, uh, I know this journal is like that. So there, there's some journals. And I was like, okay, well, let's just, I will be a model. It's me, I'm signing off yeah, on so, it. It's okay. So they asked me one time, uh, well, 
you just return this immediately to us. I was like, yeah, I just put my signature and send it back to you because that's me. <laughs> it's less hoops to jump through exactly. if you just put yourself in there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so what are we looking at here? Just talk about some of these biomechanical parameters that you examined um, with the different shooting motions, the, the free throw, the two-point, the three-point shot. So these uh, kinematic parameters that we examined in this study study were based on all the previously uh, published studies pertaining to examining differences between proficient and non-proficient shooters. So we actually found that these kinematic parameters are capable of showing, I will say, if somebody is proficient, non-proficient, and these parameters, you know, can depict um, how well that movement is And we performed. talked about this in a previous in a episode, previous, exactly. so check that yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's an internal knee angle, hip angle, elbow height, release height, release angle. I mean, and when we look at a movement, I think that uh, we split it in two phases. Right now, we're looking at a transition phase, and we can talk about it a little more, uh, a, 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 a little, little bit. <laughs> right now, I want to talk in Serbian or English. You know, there was a, there was. Right. <laughs> so we can we can talk about it a little bit later. But again, prep phase and release phase. Prep phase is usually that initial concentric movement when the player catches the ball. So when you actually start. Uh, when your butt starts moving up, that initial, right. I'll say, extension in the knee joint, and again, release phase, that's a time point when the ball left the shooter uh, hand. And again, we have used 120 frames per second, uh, high definition, high video analysis for the purpose of this investigation, um, because, again, that corresponds, if you're if we were doing golf swing or, you know, uh, baseball, you know, right. hitting, I mean, there, we, we would need much more many more so, frames. So know, yeah, but, basically, I yeah. mean, with all these, whether it was free throw, two point or three point, you had the camera set up perpendicular, perpendicular to the athlete 10 meter, yep, yep, so yep. that you can see all these different, you know, the, the ankle angle, the knee angle, hip angle, elbow angle, the release yep. height, yep. all of these different factors. That, and maybe just to review kind of briefly, and, and we talked about this in a previous episode, but, but with the preparatory phase and the release eight, release phase, what were some of the factors you saw that predicted, uh, you know, a, being a more proficient shooter versus less proficient? You is know, it the release height? Is it for, the, is it the, um, the knee angle? What what was it that you saw for three point shooting motion? Let's say I think that that's interesting. That um, eighty two uh, in eighty two point one percent of cases, just being focused on uh, elbow flexion, vertical jump right. displacement, and release angle, we were able to classify three-point shots that went in and they were missed. Mm -hmm. So those three parameters were variables that had a greater greatest contribution to determining whether that shot will be successful or non-successful. For example, if we look at a free throw movement, we actually found that a lower elbow positioning was of critical importance for success. However, people always say, okay, well, low, lower elbow positioning, let's just drop it. No, 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 no. So we came back and analyzed shoulder angle, right, internal shoulder angle that right. remained the same. So the lower elbow positioning was not achieved by flexion um, in a shoulder, greater flexion in the shoulder. It was actually achieved by greater flexion in the ankle, knee, and hip. So their butt was lower to the ground. Right. And again, there was, there was um, adjusted for player's height. So if you have a player that's like, you know, 5'8 and 6'10", you know, that, is, that, that was still adjusted for It's it. relative yeah. to their yeah. height. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, so uh, let's talk about anything else you want to add on this picture. No, I think that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so we'll <laughs> we'll go. You went with the lime green shirt that day too. Huh? I, everybody everybody <laughs> mentions that. I don't yeah, know the why. Lime no green. All right, so we'll move on to picture seven. Let's discuss in this study because um, people are probably wondering. Okay, well you had them lift yeah. an upper body session for forty five minutes, and then they went over and shot. And then you had them on another day to do the lower body session, and then they would go shoot. So let's talk about the resistance training protocols for upper body and lower body. And again, these are about, in, in total, about 45 minutes. 45 minute 45 duration. minute training 40, session. 45, yep. So we actually followed uh, NSCA guidelines um, when developing these programs. And again, we have, as you can see, like push press, barbell bench press. Again, first we started with a power um, exercises, then we, we went with a multi-joint exercises or like a core exercises fo followed by uh, single joint exercises or commonly called assistance, assistance. exercises, right? Yeah. So you can see push press. You're working again, big to small, big yeah. muscle, big exactly. multi-joint lifts, and then down to the single joint assistance stuff. Yeah. And again, you can see, you know, push press, barbell bench press. Again, I like super setting 
um, you know, when they were performing barbell bench press, they did one set of barbell bench press, then they superset it with barbell bent over row. Right. So that's how they went through it. And again, same thing applied. Right. Um, you do a push yeah. movement and you go right into a pulling movement, Agnes, right? You yeah, press exactly. and then you go pull. Same yeah. thing. I mean, if you look at a lower body, um, again, barbell back squat, tread bar, uh, deadlift with it. But again, um, that's a great was, exercise, trap yeah. bar deadlift. Yeah. I love that. Trap yeah. bar, you know, people always say, uh, people always say about trap bar. I was like, why do you like? I don't know. Basketball players love it. Oh yeah, basketball players love it, and I, I think that you know they don't. They well, don't. It's go, a little less torque on your low is, back. Yeah. You know, if you do a traditional, conventional deadlift with the bar in front, and you have this longer, you know, greater distance between the the point of force application. And the low back, that That's longer true. moment arm, I mean, you're going to have more torque on the and low back. So the, the trap bar deadlift kind of saves that. Yeah. And it's, it, it seems more specific, specific to, to yeah. the movement yeah, that you're exactly. going to actually do. For I mean, rebound, you're going up yeah. for a rebound. You know, those arms aren't in front of you out here. You're, I mean, you're, yeah. they're usually at your side and you're yeah. jumping straight up. Is, yeah. So, yeah, a trap bar deadlift is, is great just, yeah. you know, with, with the location of the bar with respect to your, your body. And then you have the, the dumbbell lunges, the, the Romanian deadlift. Yeah. So, so core exercises follow, followed by assistant. Exercise. And then we look at the percentages there. I mean, you know, I like the percentages. Those, I mean, everything is between typically 75 to 85% yeah. of their maximal strength, their one rep max. So, I mean, these are, these are not light loads. These are moderate to heavy loads yeah. that you're, that you're going to be loading. And this is a realistic, I mean, protocol. Something that's commonly performed during the in-season um, Period. Right. Main, I would say maintenance period. Right. Just to maintain their uh, strength and power. And I think that's important. And, and a good strength coach knows this, but to, to maintain strength during the season, it's it's important to still lift heavy. Yeah. The volume is something you have to think more about. I mean, yeah. you don't want them doing too much volume. You don't want to have them lifting for an hour and a half if they've, you know, they've got practices and yeah. multiple games a week and all this traveling. So it's like you get in there short and sweet, 30, 45 minutes. You lift heavy, but you keep the number of sets and reps and the volume down. But if you want to maintain strength, you, you still got to lift reasonably heavy. That's true. Yeah. That's true. All right. So um, we'll move on to talking about the results of the research. So I think we'll pull up uh, picture eight here. And picture eight, this is going to be kind of hard to see. But this is just looking again, so descriptive statistics for many of the biomechanical mechanical parameters that you examine during the preparatory phase of the free throw, two-point, and three-point shooting motions. And you can see here in that first column, I mean, gosh, you looked at so much like we saw on the, on the picture of you <laughs> in your true. lime green shirt. I mean, you're assessing the, the subjects in this study, their ankle angle and their knee angle and yeah. their hip angle and that elbow was, uh, angle and elbow was, uh, height and... So, I mean, is there anything you want to talk about? And, you know, we look at each column, you know, the free throw, the two-point, the three-point. Anything you want to highlight here or mention with this this table? A lot of data. There's a lot it, of it data. Is, it is a lot of data. It was it actually did took a lot of time to analyze this data. But, again, we have used fancy analysis. Again, restricted maximum likelihood linear mixed effect model. Right? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Um, it, it's hard to even pronounce right. it, right? And what we found, actually, that this analysis revealed that combination of all these fixed factors, fixed effects, could account for less less than 1% um, of the total variance. So, again, all these variables, basically, that we examined during the prep phase and release phase re remain relatively unchanged. So when you actually think about, it, okay, well, shooting mechanics remain unchanged. So when you look at a prep phase, okay, well, in this table, again, this is hard to, hard to look at it, but again, we wanted to report all numbers that we have. Right. So there was no sig statistically significant change in any variable after performing upper and lower body training when compared to control condition. Again, control was something that we were comparing it to, right? Right. However... Shooting percentage or shooting accuracy. Which I just remember in the control condition, they did not lift no, talk, yes, yes, before. Yes. So they just went in and shot. That was your baseline. Yes. And then it's like, well, if we have them do an upper body 45-minute workout or a lower body 45-minute workout, and then we go back and re-examine their ankle angle and the knee angle yes. and the shoulder angle, yeah. all these different parameters, is, is there any change? The has, has the lifting yeah. impacted the, the shooting mechanics. So they remain relatively the same. All parameters during a, a preparatory and release phase, such as is, is some of them that you already mentioned, uh, remain same. Again, right. they were unchanged with less than 1% of variation. However, there was statistically significant decrease in shooting percentage following the upper body training session. 
only upper body training session, lower nothing only after performing upper body training session. And which is interesting to note, that effect or the decrement in performance was only present throughout that first testing time point, throughout the first 30 minutes. After that, everything was same as control. So the conclusions of the conclusions of the conclusion of this study that we can make out of this data is that resistance exercise have minimal impact on shooting mechanics and accuracy, unless it's upper body. Upper body can diminish shooting percentage by nine to ten percent, which is you know considerable, but it is only present within the thirty minute time frame post completion of that training session of the After upper body that, training session you know yeah. it's everything is the same as control yeah okay so you know <laughs> i think that coaches will love to hear this and i have a lot of coaches that reach out oh send me this paper please because you know they're using this data to show players that yeah you can live before practice and by the way i think that yes you can because until you perform warm-up on a court you do a couple of partner shooting drills Right. You know, you're ready to, you're ready where, to play. Like yeah. you mentioned earlier, coaches are going to love hearing this. The players. players, maybe not so much like, oh, oh man, we so, we, <laughs> so we can lift before practice. That is true. As long as, you know, like you said, you, you don't go right into shooting. You, you have like a 30-minute break, which for is reasonable. Up, yeah. right? And again, for upper what, body. Do, what might be a solution? Okay, if, um, let's perform upper body training session after practice. You know, because right. lower body has no impact. Okay, well, maybe let's do lower body. And again, that's, that's up to coaches how they want to you know, plan their training regimens. But again, considering dense uh, schedules, especially on a collegiate level where you have a time restriction, right? right? How you incorporate this and implement training sessions with, um, you know, basketball specific uh, practice. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's very important. Now let's be specific too. It's this resistance training protocol yes. that has no effect. The yes. lower, if so, if you look at the lower body protocol, this exact lower body yes. protocol had no impact on free throw, two point or three point shooting percentage. Yeah, basically. if we're pushing, you know, like upper body, <laughs> you know, like you said, no effect after when, well, no effect once you got past thirty minutes, thirty minutes of rest after the upper body session. Yes. But there could be another study come out and they use a different protocol, right? Yeah, maybe the volume's exactly. higher. I mean, maybe they do more sets and reps. Well, then maybe you start having some fatigue come in whether it's a lower body or upper body training protocol, sure. and then you go have them repeat this shooting protocol. Yep. And now it's like, oh, man, there's a 15% or 20% reduction yep. in their field goal percentage because maybe they did the too much. The stimulus was different. The right. Stim exercise stimulus was The totally training different. session was yeah. different. Yep. So it's like, you know, yes, for this exact protocol, resistance training protocol, not, not too significant of an impact. But that's yeah. where I get into, I guess I'm hammering home the point, whether you're a coach sports scientist, an athlete, whoever reading these studies, you know, if you read another study that would come out in the future similar to this, look at those participants, look at the type of resistance training protocol they did for the upper and lower body, because it could be totally different. And so the results may be different, right? That's true. So that's important, right? It depends on what they have done. And again, we purposely chose something that's commonly done, you know, throughout a maintenance phase, a phase again, in-season competitive right. period. You uh, try to repeat what is actually usually normally yep, done. Yep, yeah. Yep. So again, as we say, um, resistance exercise when performed prior to um, shooting session has minimal impact. And again, the only impact that can be seen is after performing upper body training session, again, decrement in performance approximately 10 percent that disappears it's not present 30 minute following right. the completion of resistance exercise session yeah and we can pull up picture nine um so i guess this is just continuing on um looking at again some more descriptive statistics i don't see anything bolded here anything yeah. significant so again just looking at more you know release angles release height so this was actually during the release phase you're just looking so at these. the table the first the previous table that we saw again there's the, the, that's a list of variables that we have seen again and that was preparatory each of these phase. Session preparatory phase again for free throw two point and three point shooting drills for control control lower and upper body um training sessions right and again that some of those variables are ankle angle knee angle hip angle everything that we have previously mentioned and the table that you're seeing right now on the screen it's actually uh release height release um angle heel heel height or representation of actually vertical jump displacement uh entry angle we used actually a specific camera that's 
mounted on the top of the basket to actually look at an entry angle to estimate an entry angle. Right. That was pretty kind of fancy. It's new technology, but again, um, it, it was it was pretty good. So. You know, the entry angle is interesting. I think about that. Now, this is anecdotal. I'm thinking back to when I was in high yeah. school. Now, maybe some days I, I overdid it in the weight room and then I would, you know, go to practice or be, yeah. be shooting. And I felt like because I may have done too much and was fatigued, my shot was flatter, right? <laughs> so it's like either my legs were tired or maybe my tricep was tired. Yeah. And so I wasn't getting enough arc on the ball. And so the entry angle would have been more acute. And maybe I felt like my shot was flatter <laughs> if maybe I overdid it in the weight room and they went out there. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, this is actually funny. Anecdotally. Uh, That's funny that you mentioned that because right now, um, we just published another study a couple of weeks ago looking at a free throw uh, shooting performance. We use markerless motion capture system um, to examine that instead of video analysis. And what we found is that in the transition phase, right, between, again, prep phase and release phase, the transition phase, what we are actually showing is that peak and mean joint angular velocities were smaller for proficient shooters and people say oh well small well that probably indicates that they perform free throw shooting motion in more controlled manner you know because if you have novice players you know they'll just throw a ball so i think that something that we're looking into is these joint velocities that may be able to explain why did that decrement in performance happen again you know i always talk to uh, you know, uh, people in our department, uh, Trent Herda, right? Mm-hmm. They're 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 doing like an EMG stuff, and I'm like, okay, can we can we maybe see something? And I'm I'm far away from EMG professional, right? But again, um, can we can we do something to see what's what's what's, what's going at the in, neuromuscular exactly, level, the way what, the nervous system is communicating with the muscle in these different states, like whether you're fatigued or maybe you overdid it in the weight room, and then can that be a potential reason why that 30 minute uh, decrement? in performance mm-hmm. following upper body training session occurred. You know, I think that's, again, uh, much more research is needed to determine the, to determine right. w- w- what's going on. But again, I think that uh, this is one of the first studies that looked at this. And I think that uh, to come back to opening argument and uh, where did the motivation to, come, to, to conduct this study come from, it's basically practical application. Right. Should we lift? Well, I do want to lift. I don't want to lift. It impairs my performance. It improves my performance. You know, you're saying, well, my entry angle decreased. Again, we're coming back to what What did you do? Are you, you know, uh, resistance trained? What was your protocol do, did you right. perform? What was the volume, intensity, yeah. number of sets, number of reps? You know, I think that Dr. Fry published study, I think it was like 20, 30 years ago, when they looked at the combinations. How many, how many resistance training regimens is there? If you just manipulate, oh. I mean, if you manipulate rest if you manipulate intensity volume number of exercises bar sets, speed velocity uh, yeah i think that you can There's get like what millions, millions and millions, millions, and millions of combinations yeah. yeah i think that's a great paper i always i always pull it up and always talk about it but yeah yeah and i do think going back to mine if i look at the volume that was used in this study and i think part of it was because i was smaller and i, I mean strength coaches would have to kick me out of the weight room because i was wanting to put on more strength and more muscle for all the sports I played. Yeah. I mean, because it wasn't just basketball. I was trying to play football and all these other sports as well. But it was like I was wanting to get stronger and I needed more muscle on me because I was a skinny little runt back you in know, high school. So it was funny. like I think I could overdo it. And then I'd bring some of that fatigue into practice. So if it was like, well, that's not good because then it's affecting my shot. But it was just me trying to develop as an athlete. But I was a little overambitious sometimes. Bigger, faster, stronger. You know, there was a – there was a, there was a, a – a, um... I was always with my former strength coach at James Madison, Greg Warner. He's at Virginia Tech right now. Uh, that, was, that, that was basically the first thing that when I walked into the weight room, sir, what are we doing? Bigger, faster, yep. stronger. Let's go. <laughs> you know, and uh, I always listened to his advice. So, you yeah. just don't want that. That's where it's, it's, you know, strength coaches have to work so closely with the actual sport coach because you don't want the training that you're doing to try to, to build these physical performance characteristics, the strength, the power, the agility, the speed, all this to start to negatively impact the actual sports specific skills and what you're trying to improve in practice. And that's where, oh, it's such a, that's true. It's such a delicate balance. I think, and and I think that that is a future of research within this area applied to sports specific environment. You know, where's the, I will say range where you have to, right. You know, and is that where you have to stay, but is it different for you, me, 
probably. Right. You know, so is it position specific? That's another paper we actually. Well, this about. is where a lot of the athlete monitoring and things like that. Well, that, that's, that's a, you a know we other. can we can yeah. we can we can push out like ten and right. more podcasts talking about this, and I can talk to you all day about this. Stuff. Well, let, well, let's go on to the next picture so we can keep this yeah. moving. Um, so picture ten. Um, we'll, we'll pull up this next table. Uh, so this is looking at you, I guess you want to talk about this because we do have some things that are bolded, well, highlighted in yellow here. You know, statistically significant doesn't mean sometimes that's uh, practically significant. Right. And that's what we're saying again. Uh, what well, you can see here, some of the bolded values did reach level of statistical significance, but, but, but again, uh, the effect sizes were very, very, very small. And again, right. in practical setting, it's coming back to those changes. Uh, the combination of all these factors was less than 1%. Right. So, so that just because statistics say one thing and, oh, it's, we see stati yeah. statistically significant changes in um, these different groups, like you said, in practice, Nah. You know, sometimes it can work out other way. You know, if yeah. if you actually have, for example, we had a study. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the first studies that we have published here when I came here, what, six years ago at KU. Um, it, was, uh, it was a study looking at the uh, influence of uh, eating breakfast on basketball shooting <laughs> <laughs> performance. I mean, that's right. funny. And again, that also came from, from, a, from a locker room because it's like, I don't want to eat breakfast before. Oh, I do. So right. we actually showed that eating breakfast was kind of associated with improvement in shooting performance. I think that, uh, I, I haven't looked at this study for many years, but again, I think that three to 5% improvement mm -hmm. in free throw shooting performance. And I'm like, wow, well, that was not statistically significant, right? But there again, was probably a trend. That is practically significant. Right. You know? So I think that how you interpret the data, sometimes we actually like to put effect sizes mm -hmm. um, to interpret the magnitude of the difference in our research. Right. Um, papers that we publish, but yeah, I mean, this is just statistics. I don't, we, we, we don't need to bug uh, right. listeners because conclusion that we previously mentioned, yeah. I think summarizes um, everything. And, and I guess if we just move to picture 11, this is just, this next picture is I actually just this, the, the second part of this chart. Yeah, so again, second part of the chart. So there, there's thing. some yep. things that are statistically yep. significant highlighted in yellow, but it, it in practice, it yeah. didn't have really... Yeah. For, I mean, for individuals that are uh, interested in uh, interpreting fixed effect semi-partial R-square effect <laughs> sizes, they yeah. can look at this right, table right. and they can, um, uh, but yeah, for, for I would say practitioners, probably it's let's more important to Let's get to the to conclusion. On, we'll yeah, get to the yeah. conclusion. So let's yeah. just pull up the picture 12, this, this conclusion here, which, which you mentioned earlier. You, you, we jumped right from the results into the conclusion, yeah. but just so people can see how you have it written in the paper, they can read through all that. But if you just want to summarize it again, in your own words, the conclusion of your study, the take home message, yeah. what coaches, athletes can walk away yeah. um, with from, from this study. The take home message is that um, commonly implemented resistance training regimens, upper and lower body uh, resistance training regimens have minimal impact on free throw two-point and three-point shooting mechanics and accuracy. And again, mechanics based on the variables that we have examined. Because there was a slight decrease in performance, something happened. So we are looking into that to actually see what caused that approximately 10% decrease in performance. But if we look at these findings based on the variables that we have examined, again, these biomechanical parameters during preparatory and release phases of the shooting motion, and again, just overall accuracy, we can see that Performing upper and lower body resistance exercise prior to, I'll say, let's say basketball practice has minimal impact on shooting accuracy. Right. Except upper body. Upper body, again, can have a minimal impact or decrease approximately 10% in two-point right. and three-point shooting accuracy when compared to a control training session, but that disappears 30 minutes right. uh, post-completion of that resistance exercise session. So for coaches, uh, you know, yeah, you can tell players that they can lift. And again, lift similar to these uh, resistance protocols examined in this right. study. For players, I guess they're probably mad because they're like, oh, dang, Man. we got to lift before. <laughs> right. So I always wanted to lift before practice, you know, but sometimes sometimes you're too tired. You know, if you're, if you're in a court and, you know, you got to be focused – you know, two hours on a basketball plays, you know, after that, you might be tired. Well, know? it'd be hard to, hard to lift with the same strength and, and you know, intensity. Yeah. In some cases, after a basketball practice, you try to go in and lift because we think of energy systems, you know, which true. we, <laughs> we could get into that in another episode. But um, 
yeah, if you can knock that lift out, quick lift, 30, 45 minutes, follow the protocols that are that we just talked about here. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it minimally impacts or your shooting performance. I mean, and like you said, it's it's not unreasonable to allow 30 minutes rest period between that upper body session and going going into practice. I mean, you're completing warm up, couple of partner shooting drills, and you're yeah. good. Yeah. You know? So it's usually you're not getting into five on oh, five on five, three on three um, actions immediately. You know. So yeah. And I think this is just a part of our basketball line of research. There will be a lot of other studies coming up uh, with the professional athletes. Again, um, as I previously mentioned, we're trying to. Um, connect with, many, with uh, as many as we can uh, coaches, practitioners uh, worldwide, and we're always open to discussing collaborative opportunities. So, yeah, JPL ears are always open. That's, yep. I'm, I'm, I stole that from Dr. Fry. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> right. Collaborate, right? Collaborate. That's, a, that's important. Keyword, yeah. So any other take-home points you'd like to add about anything? I'm trying to just open in the floor, you know. Say, say I think your that, final thoughts. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that we regarding this paper, we we, we sliced it in many different um, aspects, and uh, yeah, I think that takes it home. You know, the conclusion the conclusion of this paper, and as I say, something that we're looking right now, we're looking at the impact of fatigue, actually how fatigue influences shooting mechanics and accuracy. Trying to implement innovative technologies such as markerless motion capture systems to examine. Um, biomechanical parameters or shooting motion. Something yeah. we're looking right now is to actually see how neuromuscular performance, for example, changes. It's a little bit different than this, but how neuromuscular performance changes pre-post practice as well as pre-post game. Something that we were able to accomplish as a, as, as, as a lab is we actually co collected data on a professional basketball players during a game. And I think that um, was this a salivary sample? No, that was that was already published. Oh, okay, we we're talking okay. about something that was recently done. Yes, so we actually uh, th that paper is published. Uh, again, looking at a uh, uh, testosterone and cortisol as well as TC ratio throughout mm -hmm. a simulated game. But again, this was real game right now. So right. okay, um, you know, maybe next couple of months when we crunch the numbers and um, publish that uh, data set. We, we can catch up again maybe well there will be a third time right, right. well and it, it reminds me like i said you know talking about fatigue and the impact on performance that's such a key thing to look at yep. because you know if you've had fatigued athletes especially in the fourth quarter of you know any sport basketball football i mean that's a lot of times that the team that's behind but they're less fatigued yep you know they they come back and, defense yeah defense and you know start getting out of position start playing sloppy turnovers you not, not thinking well i mean and then, like you said, how does it affect shot mechanics? And I just think back, and like I said, this is anecdotal, but maybe you'll validate what I felt or thought when I would do too much <laughs> resistance training and then go into practice. I was like, man, my shot feels flat. I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm moving as well. And it was, it was probably just because I was fatigued. Like it maybe that fatigue I felt like that's altered true. my shooting, yep. my mechanics. But it can be. That's yeah. where the strength coach, it's so important that you have a program that doesn't fatigue that athlete before they go into practice, right? That is true. I mean, that is true. Or get your, you know, I wouldn't, I was stubborn. So it's like, get out of the weight room. Like, no more. You're going to be fatigued going into practice and your shot mechanics are going to be all screwed up. Yeah. So, well, it all depends how much, what do you do, you know, and uh, I mean, it's, it's all component of it. But, so many variables yeah, to look yeah. at. How can people contact you if they have questions about your research or improving their shooting mechanics and accuracy and just their overall ability to play basketball? Email, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, dr. Dr. Dimitri. Chabarkapa, my first name, last name. Feel free to reach out. Email, Instagram, LinkedIn. Always happy to talk sports science, especially basketball performance with you. All right. Well, thank you for coming in today to discuss your research, Dr. Chabarkapa. If you have questions for me about the KU Exercise Science Program, send an email to jtaylor at ku.edu or call 913-897-8516. Thanks for watching this basketball sports science edition of Fitness Facts. <laughs>